Hey, Critical Composer here, and I'd like to discuss uh, some things that Steam Input could be doing better that other profiling software is already doing. Specifically today we're going to be talking about Rewazd and Joyshock Mapper, also known as JSM. We're going to start with Rewazd right here uh, because I think it's the most powerful one to date. It's kind of the one that I use uh, more often than not. Now I will put uh, a small disclaimer out there. Uh, Rewazd is not the end all be all solution right now. It currently lacks true touchpad support and it lacks gyro support. Though for their benefit, they are working on gyro and they hope to have it out in a close release. So that one will soon be a non-issue, but it's kind of really big. Gyro aiming is a huge part of first-person shooter controls. Uh, and also, neither of these programs support the Steam controller. So I know a lot of you are Steam controller users. Uh, I love my Steam controller. These programs do not support that. Uh, I'm pushing uh, a little hard for Rewaz to support the Steam controller, but uh, I think I'm really the only one asking for it. I doubt it's it's high up on the feature list. Uh, so with those two caveats in mind, these are some features that Rewazd and JSM have that Steam Input does not. The first one I want to look at is hardware support. And I think this is kind of a big one. Rewazd supports the Xbox Elite Controller's paddles. I'm pretty sure it's the only software that does this actually. Uh, as it says, you can um, get the full support of the Elite Controller's paddles without the native Xbox uh, application that would run on Windows 10. That is huge. I don't think there's another program that does that. On top of that, we also have the PlayStation Navigation support, which if you don't know, was kind of like the nunchuck for the PS Move. It does not have gyro capabilities, but it is a one-handed controller with full access to joystick, d-pad, two buttons, and two triggers, which is not anything to scoff at if you're wanting to do disconnected controllers like, um, you know, like if you're doing Joy-Cons or Wiimote trying to emulate that on PC. Uh, the other thing it does is Joy-Cons. And it doesn't say right here, but it also does mouse and keyboard. So those are all really big, and I want to keep the PlayStation Navigation and Joy-Con section kind of in the back of your mind. We're going to be coming back to that on a later setting that really amplifies how amazing those two devices can be with, with Rewazd. So we have three controllers, well, technically two controllers, and then the paddles of a third one, and then mouse and keyboard support that Steam Input does not have. Let's move on to the software now, and the UI is gorgeous. Steam Input has a very functional UI. It can be a little overwhelming. I mean, this can be overwhelming too. There's a lot going on here, and part of that's just because it's a complex-ish config for the desktop use. Um, but there's a lot of nice things. When you click on a button, it has its own menu, and you can change pretty much everything from here joysticks if you want to edit anything about the joysticks real nice visuals about everything you're doing you can change uh response i guess you can't change the response curve unless you're doing x input um but there's a lot of stuff in here that you can change around and it's all visually defined which is really nice but the first feature i want to look at is activators much like Steam Input, we have single press, we have long press, double, start, and release. We also have a triple press. Now, it's not a game changer, but the few times that I've needed to push a button three times to kind of get that third binding on a specific button, it has come in handy. I can't understate how useful it is when you need it. Uh, another thing I want to look at is percentage-based analog bindings, and this happens on the joystick or triggers. And basically, I can come in here to the x-axis, or both the x and y-axis if I wanted to. Actually, that shouldn't say x-axis. That is just 
the axis as a whole. These are basically inner and outer ring bindings. Um, on elliptical, you can actually do different inner and outer ring radiuses for each axis. But in radial, they, they all operate on the same set. But you have your dead zone, you have your inner ring, you have your middle section, and your outer ring. They call it a uh, low, medium, and high. And each of these can be set to their own binding, complete with turbo if you needed it. And on high, you can actually use a toggle. Not only that, but you can also put any combination of buttons on here. So if you wanted to do, um, if you wanted to set up a macro or something, each of these layers, each of these areas could have their own macro on them. And the joysticks are very sim. I mean, the triggers are very similar. We go in here to the zones, and we have low, medium, and high, and we can change these just like we could on the joystick, change the dead zone below the medium and high, and then give them all different bindings. So with this, you could emulate the soft and full pull of the Steam controller or Steam input uh, the same way, except now you have three bindings rather than uh, two. Though, unless you have a Steam, well, the Steam controller doesn't work with this. It, it's really difficult to do without the physical click, though. You're, you're really trying to move a very small trigger in dividing that small trigger range into thirds. Um, it works really well for soft and full, though, where you kind of ramp this up. And then you put the same thing on low and medium, and then you give high your full pull, so you have a 90% range for your soft pull, and then your full pull is only in the last 10%. That works pretty well for me. So yeah, we have analog or or percentage-based analog input. Something else it does is numerical turbo inputs. If I wanted to make down turbo, I could tell it how often it wanted to repeat. That's uh, It repeats once every 200 milliseconds. And I can change that to 50 or whatever. I don't have to worry about a slider and trying to figure out what the slider means or having to pull out a mouse to hover over the slider to get the numerical value and then trying to translate that to milliseconds. It's all right here, very straight. If you know exactly how often you want your turbo to fire off, you just put it in right here. That is real nice. Uh, one, main, one main thing about Rewaz, I mentioned the UI is very intuitive, but data entry is also intuitive. There are very few sliders in here. A lot of the stuff is done uh, with clean visuals and with actual raw numbers and data. And that, that kind of going to continue through this entire thing as I, over, as I look over some of this stuff. Is it's easier to input things. The next thing I want to look at is the macro editor. And basically, uh, let me pull up a, um, a blank one. I don't want to mess with that too much. If I want to make a macro and I wanted to open up the chat box and say hello, I simply come into this nice editor, I hit record, enter opens a chat box, hello, enter to send it. Now I have a clean macro, or an easy to make macro, that presses enter, and then H-E-L-L-O, and then presses enter again. And uh, if I ever wanted to remove anything in here or move it, it's all easily done. If I wanted the E to go down before the H goes up, done. If I don't want any pauses and I want it to be entered in as quickly as possible, I could do that too and just go through and remove all the all the pauses. Uh, I can also change the length. All these values are done in milliseconds. I could add rumble if I wanted specifically when the E came through to rumble to let me know that I pushed E for whatever reason. I drop a rumble in there. Now it's going to rumble for 150 milliseconds after the E is pushed down and before the H is pulled up. I can also add a break if I wanted to put a pause in the uh in the entire thing uh, it's just phenomenal i can also use any mouse keys uh xbox buttons 
and I can choose to instead of execute it in order to hold every button in the combo until I let go of the button. That's more of like assigning a, um, a multi key binding in Steam input, but it's nice that we can just really easily key that in. And the last thing I want to look at, well, second to last thing as far as software goes, is that you'll notice here there's a PlayStation logo. That's because this can send Xbox commands, just like Steam Input does, but I can also change it to DualShock, and it sends PlayStation commands to the game. And this is really big because one of the large oversights in Steam Input is that if you're using a DualShock 4, you either have to choose between getting your glyphs in game with your native support or getting the profiling support of Steam Input and having to deal with the Xbox buttons. This way you can get your profiling support, you can make your crazy configs, but you can also see your um, DualShock 4, your PlayStation button glyphs in the game because the game still sees a DualShock 4 controller. So that's real nice for DualShock 4 users. Uh, that's one of the big complaints I've seen in Steam Input is that if you use Steam Input, then you're not getting your, your native configs, and uh, that uh, it just kind of ruins the experience a little bit for me. So, and then, oh, uh, we also, I, I skipped this one, my apologies. We have shortcuts, and these are basically your corded bindings from Steam Input, and it's not a new feature. Um, it's not something that it can do that Steam Input can't, but it's one of those instances where it's just easier to do it this way. B ported bindings are very difficult to wrap your head around, especially for a novice user of Steam Input who's not really familiar with everything. It's kind of implemented, I'm not going to say poorly, but it's difficult. It, it's not intuitive. But here... I can choose up to four buttons and I can say, you know, if L3 and circle and options are all pushed together, then we're going to move the mouse to the left until they're released. Done. That's it. And when I come back out here, you can see that this is part of a shortcut, part of a, a chord, if you will, uh, and it's used with all these other buttons. Really nice, really simple. Um, the big part though, and this is what I wanted you to remember about the Joy-Con and the navigation controller, is that any controller or device can be joined into a single emulated device. So right now I'm looking at the DualShock alone, but at any point in time, I could add this to my mouse. And when I pull up my config, I actually have my mouse and my gamepad in the same exact profile now. And one thing this does is it allows multiple devices to auto load configs based on a game. So if I am running Battlefield 1, I don't want to have to worry about my mouse and my keyboard and my controller and my foot pedals or whatever and making sure that they're all switching over. This pulls everything into a single group and says when this game's run, apply the single config that's going to apply to all of your devices. Another cool thing about it, as you can see right here, these are um, action layers basically. And right stick click is what I use. I hold it to, to enter into this layer and when I release it, we go back to layer zero. But when I hold right stick click in to shift, the mouse is going to get shifted to layer one as well, and every device in this group. So, on the basis, this idea of combining uh, hardware is used so that you can use two Joy Cons at the same time. And they can be paired together and be seen as a single controller to any game. But the fact that they went out of their way to expand it means that we have so many other cool options. I had mentioned foot pedals, and foot pedals can be typically get shown up as uh, a keyboard or some sort of HID device, and this will probably pick it up. If not, it's really easy to configure, uh, but you can actually mode shift your keyboard and mouse using your foot pedals if you wanted to. Um, another thing would be people who want to use their mouse in their right hand and maybe a Joy-Con or a navigation controller in their left so that they can have analog movement and mouse aim 
without having any sort of encumbrance by trying to juggle a controller. And you can use maybe your mouse side buttons to mode shift your gamepad that's in your left hand. It's just, the whole idea is bonkers and unbelievably cool. And the fact that you can combine up to four devices into a single device that's seen by the game. And then they can all mode shift each other. And it's, it's just, when it works, it's phenomenal. So uh, that is all the stuff that's cool about Rewaz that Steam Input could really learn from. But I mentioned that Gyro is not supported yet. And that's kind of a huge red flag not to use Rewaz much right now, especially if you're somebody who wants to use the controller for first-person shooters. Well, this is where JSM comes in. JSM does some really cool stuff that Steam Input doesn't. And it all revolves around aiming. Now, Joystock Mapper is a little different from Rewaz in that it's entirely terminal-based. And your configs are text-based. And that's probably going to turn people off. It doesn't have a UI currently. But a UI is in the works. Uh, there's no time frame on it. It's just two people working on it in their spare time. Huge shout out to Electronics and uh, Gibsmart for making this program. Fantastic stuff. Um, but one of the cool things that JSM does is it calibrates cameras. Well, it calibrates the in-game camera or mouse cursor movement if you're playing a 2D game. Um, well, a game that uses the mouse cursor like an RTS or a MOBA. And it, translate it translates it to real-world movement. So that you end up with a one-to-one -one movement. If you want to turn 90 degrees in a first-person shooter, you, ro you rotate your controller 90 degrees. And you end up using a real-world calibration, and you pair that against the in-game sensitivity so that you end up with a one-to-one. -one. That is what this calibration does. From there, you either ignore or compensate for uh, the OS mouse speed, which is typically for your mouse sensitivity. Um, if a game supports raw input, you would just ignore it. If a game doesn't support raw input, then you would counter it so that you can still keep your one-to-one. -one. But then here's the real cool part, and it's how the gyro works based off of this. Um, the sensitivity is all done in multiply, uh, multiplication, multipliers, where one is a 1 to 1 ratio and 10 is a 10 to 1 ratio. It's very easy to understand that on a 10 to 1 ratio, if you want to turn 90 degrees, you only have to turn 9 in real life. So what I have is a minimum of gyro, and this is for uh, Counter-Strike, CSGO, uh, a minimum gyro where I move at 1 to 1, which is what I use for fine aiming, and a maximum gyro of 10 to 1, which I use for looking around. And then we have a threshold, and this is basically acceleration. And I know that's a bad word. I probably shouldn't even say it. I know people really hate acceleration. But the way acceleration is handled in JSM is something that Steam Input can really learn from. And it basically says if you're rotating your controller on the minimum, zero degrees per second or lower, use the minimum sensitivity. If you're rotating your, on the max, if you're rotating 75 degrees per second or higher, so if you're turning your controller real fast, use 10. Use a 10 to 1 ratio. And for everything in between, use a sliding uh, ratio between 1 and 10. So halfway between this would be 37. So if I was rotating 37 degrees per second, I would have a 5 to 1 ratio. It's all very mathematical. It's very easy to understand. There's no sliders. It's not abstracted data. Uh, it's all very raw and understandable. If I ever felt like my gyro was moving too fast, uh, I would know how to change this. If I felt like uh, I wasn't rotating as fast as I wanted to, I could reduce the maximum threshold. Or you can just run it straight and do uh, a gyro sends of three and you have a three to one at all times there's no acceleration 
It's all very direct and to the point, and I love that. And the fact that the acceleration works so well and is so customizable, uh, I hate acceleration and steam input. Um, I found that low was an okay setting, but medium and high were usually too varied to really dial in muscle memory for. And I've been using this uh, with a DualShock 4 for a couple weeks now, and I feel like I have muscle memory dialed in for acceleration because it's acceleration that I created by hand. It's acceleration tailored to me. So that's uh, the, the way that we can handle how the config feels is something Steam Input can really learn from. Abstracting sliders based on percentages that are then turned into values on the back end, it's convoluted it makes no sense to the user and it's really difficult to really quantify what you're actually changing right here everything's math based I, I i can see what i need i well i know what i want i can see how to edit it and i can just do it straight up the other cool thing is flick sticking and this might sound really weird to a couple of people and i'm going to actually to most people you basically turn the right stick and you assign bindings for easy 90 and 100 degree turns, and it works in any first person shooter. And that's really all you need to know about it. Uh, I'm going to pull up a quick video where the creator kind of explains a little bit about it. This is the flick stick. It lets you turn the camera by rotating the right stick. When you first press the stick, you'll make a smooth and quick flick to face exactly the same direction as the stick. You can make further adjustments by rotating the stick, giving you quick access to whatever direction suits you best. The right stick is too small for really precise. And uh, it, you can use the rotation to continue turning left and right, uh, but I don't really use it for that because, I'm like I said, I mostly use it for 90 and 100 degree turns. I can put a 180 degree, degree turn in any first person shooter. Classic Doom, who had no idea about anything like that, that most people would play with arrow keys, bam. I got a single button I can do a 180 degree, 80 degree turn on and start shooting at somebody who's attacked me from behind. And that's honestly all I need it for. Flick sticking is really cool stuff and Steam Input really needs to add that in there. But the problem is it requires real world calibration. It needs to program the joystick to a one to one so that a full rotation of the joystick is a full 360 degree turn in game. So that if you push it down, uh, the program, which would be Steam Input in this situation, knows exactly how far to move the mouse to turn you 180 degrees. And the real-world calibration would basically need a database of every game to kind of um, apply it. So I don't see it ever really happening to Steam Input because it would require a lot of user work. But if Valve could figure out a way to create a database or have a workshop where users could add the values to the database, and then it would auto load those values for new users, that would be fantastic. So that is Rewaz and JSM and some of the cool things they do that Steam Input does not. Um, and I bring up JSM because it does gyro and the flick sticking and it works in tandem with Rewaz. So if some of the Rewaz stuff looked really cool and you wanted to mess around with it and you have a DualShock or an Xbox controller or you wanted to use two, two Joy-Cons to play, uh, you know, Overwatch or something, you can with Rewaz and JSM. They work well together. JSM handles my gyro aiming and Rewaz can handle all your other uh, re uh, remapping. JSM also has rudimentary remapping built in. It has corded bindings. Um, long presses and regular presses. Um, it has full profiling suite, but it's all done through text. I know that might not be everybody's cup of tea, which is why I tend to pair it with the nice UI of Rewaz. Um, but there are there is a very competent alternative to Steam Input if uh, Steam Input is feeling lackluster to you these days, or if you just need something that's decentralized from a platform. Um, you know, these, these two programs work well together and they have a lot of cool stuff that Steam Input could really, really use. All right, and uh, that's that. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it was informational. And uh, you might 
and hopefully we can petition Steam Input to incorporate some of these ideas. Um, if there's anything you like, go ahead and put it into the suggestions discussion for the Steam Controller, which is where the Steam Input suggestions, the software suggestions are uh, they're looked for by the devs.